Welcome to VM Wealth Talks. I'm Khalilo Reynolds, and I'm going to be taking you through these proceedings, guiding you through these proceedings today. In this edition, we are talking about cryptocurrency, the evolution of investing. Now, this is a very sexy topic. A lot of people are interested in cryptocurrency right now. You may have heard about Bitcoin, Ethereum, Dogecoin, and so many other coins. Bitcoin now at like 50-something thousand US dollars for one coin, you know. Wow. So we're going to be hearing all about it from an esteemed panel of guests. So let me tell you who we have. Our speakers for this event are Darren McGregor, Assistant Manager of Research at VM Wealth. We have Marco Hefe, CEO and co-founder of Blockstation. Jay Waterman is CTO and Chief Enterprise Architect and co-founder of Blockstation as well. We have Cadill McNaught Hermit, who is the Manager, Registrar and Depository Services at the Jamaica Stock Exchange. And we also have Everton McFarlane, Executive Director at the Financial Services Commission, the FSC. So welcome to all our speakers and thank you for logging on. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for your interest in this topic. Now, to start us off, we'll have our first presenter who's right here beside me, Darren McGregor. Hi, Darren. Hi, Kalilo. How are you doing? I'm all right, and you? I am quite well as well. So let's start off by just talking about what is cryptocurrency. All right, so um, cryptocurrency is a pretty broad topic. Um, if we were to really get into it, um, we could spend hours talking about it, but um, you know, as an investor, which is the lens through which I approach it, you know, there are certain key things that we have to understand, right? We have to understand these key driving factors. We have to understand the background. Um, we have to understand, well, what is it, right? So in my talk today, I'm going to talk about, you know, what it is, give a little historical background, you know, how it um, came up, how the space developed over time, um, how to access the space and some of the risks and benefits of accessing that space, because it's still a quite, it's quite a nascent space, mm -hmm. right? So, at the very least, you have to ensure that you know how to protect yourself and you know what you're getting into, right? Um, talk a little bit about, you know, the regulatory space, both locally and internationally. Um, I know some of our speakers might be able to get into a bit more depth on that. So, I'll just t touch on it as a high level. Right? Okay. Yeah. So. All right. Good stuff. So, we'll be looking forward to, to all of that. So, why is cryptocurrency an area to watch? All right, so cryptocurrency is an area to watch because um, it really can represent a very significant innovation in money that we haven't seen in um, maybe a century. Um, changes in money don't happen very often. And as we see, as it's, it's developing now, it's developing quite rapidly. Bitcoin is just a little over 10 years old, but it's gone from a penny to... Uh, one one billion plus um one trillion plus uh, market in in that time so i mean something that's you know appreciating that rapidly you know even if you're not going to get involved it's a good idea to probably understand what's going on why people are talking about this mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right yeah so what's the difference between the different types of coins like that kind of confuses people right so i mean most coins are, are kind of along the same path of things. You have um, proof of work coins, coins which are, you know, they're, they're reliant on what's called mining, right? So it relies heavily on a lot of computational power to verify transactions and secure the network. You have, um, to a lesser degree, because it's a newer concept, proof of stake, which it, it relies more on a process of, you know, putting up collateral to, to verify transactions. But most of them, most of the currencies are proof of work type. They're similar to Bitcoin. And to be fair, a lot of them are what are called forks of Bitcoin, meaning that you really just took the Bitcoin code, changed, you know, one or two things and created something new. So for example, Bitcoin, the maximum supply is 21 million, right? Um, you could change it so that the maximum supply is 84 million. And it's no longer a Bitcoin. It's something entirely different. And now you have a new coin. Mm -hmm. right? Very interesting. What are the hot ones to watch right now? Um, the hot ones, I would say, are, are Bitcoin, Ethereum. Um, I have no idea why, but Dogecoin. <laughs> um, I don't know why it's, it's um, accelerating value so quickly. 
It's up all, almost 100% this week. Well, Elon Musk tweeted about it last week. He tweeted the Dodge father. Yeah. And ever since then, it just shot up because people take Elon Musk as, you know, Bible. And I don't know if there's anything beyond that, but I, I don't really see anything fundamental about Dogecoin that really, you it know, warrants It started out as a joke, right? It did. It did. So, so, and, and there are lots of those in the space. There, there was one in particular whereby its, its name was this is a scam don't buy something like that right <laughs> and it just ran up in value before you know crashed to zero mm -hmm. you know somebody just took advantage of you know the um euphoria around the space to run away with some cash so can anybody create a coin like what gives it value then um the short answer is yes um the long answer is it's wildly difficult and it requires a lot of work to protect it and it's better if it's not run by just one person but by a network mm. so that there are more people involved there are more people working towards securing it more people working towards developing it um and quite frankly it's 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 very difficult to get much trust from a new cryptocurrency um just because of how murky the space can be so at this point, Bitcoin, Ethereum, some of the, the mainstays, Litecoin, they really have a strong advantage because of how long they've been around. They've, to some degree, been battle tested. So it, it would probably be wise to focus on those. So give me a little bit of that history then. So how long has cryptocurrency been around? All right. So Bitcoin was the first cryptocurrency, right? It was put forward by an individual or a group of individuals using this um, pseudonym Satoshi Nakamoto um, in a white paper in 2008 called Bitcoin Peer-to-Peer uh, -peer Payment System, something to that effect, right? And I, I think where it really came from around the time, it was around the time of the financial crisis in the US where, you know, it really came out that the banks were doing some things with your money that, you know, you may not be happy about if you knew about it beforehand or were really paying attention, right? And the persons have this counterpart exposure to the bank. You know, if, if the bank loses, you might lose your deposit in the bank, right? So it kind of begged the question, do I really need a third party to, you know, if, if, if I'm paying you, Kalila, mm -hmm. do I need a third party to be involved in that transaction? How can I do that without a third party? How can I custody my own assets, mm -hmm. right? And and that's some of the thinking that went into, you know, let's try and see if we can build this thing, right? So um, as a digital asset, you know, we, we've had digital assets for decades now, but um, what kind of prevented it from getting into the money space is that you had to find a way to prevent double spending, right? So what I mean by that is if you think about an email, I can send you an email and you can copy it and send it to a number of persons, right? Um, but cryptocurrency has really solved that problem because each, each, in this case, each Bitcoin, right? Um, it, it, the, the transaction has to be verified by the network. It's cryptographically secured. Each Bitcoin is um, fungible. It's, it's, it's the same. Each Bitcoin, one Bitcoin is the same as another, right? but it cannot be copied um, just like that, right? There's a fixed supply, there's a fixed me mechanism for which it's being transferred, and you cannot transfer it outside of that protocol. Okay, okay. So 2008 to 2021, Bitcoin has been around for about 13 years. Why is it that it just suddenly took off last year? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, I, 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 I too sometimes wonder why, because I mean, if you think about when it was at $300 and it went up to $5,000, right? Mm -hmm. That's a pretty meteoric rise, right? And I guess there was some attention that came out of that, but it's kind of weird. And that was when? Huh? That was when? This would have been years ago. Yeah. It, and it's funny. It's, it's it, Not that long because I remember in 2016, which is when I was first, ra my awareness was first really raised about Bitcoin. It was at $700. Right. 25 years ago. Right, right, right. So, and, and the space is moving so fast. It's like, if you, if you watch a video a year or two ago about, you know, Bitcoin and stuff, they're talking about, you know, less than 10,000 prices. Mm -hmm. And now we're at 57,000, mm -hmm. right? 
and I guess because it's it's rising at such a meteoric pace, you know, there are all these people on Twitter who are talking about, oh, we're going to have, you know, $100,000 parties in um, 2020 because we think Bitcoin's going to get 100000 And now it's it's really getting up there and look like it has the potential to get to that level, mm-hmm. right? Um, there's a lot of mainstream attention that it's, it's getting right now. Um, you have um, large banks that are, are looking at it. You have Morgan Stanley um, recently that announced that they're going to look at you know offering it to their high net worth clients um and that's been a space that's been quite against it for a while and it's understandable because their their business is one where risk is is really important and i guess after 2008 you know they're a bit more skittish in how they approach risk yeah right i think i think a lot of large banks a lot of institutional investors aren't just looking at it but are also invested in right. Bitcoin. Right. So we were talking about this on my YouTube show just yesterday. And one of the points that was raised is that 30% of Bitcoin is now owned by banks yeah. within the past year. Yeah. So you think that is one of the reasons there's been so much confidence in the past 12 months and the price has skyrocketed? Um, it, it's hard to say if it's that because it's such a, a, a widely distributed network. Um, different groups different persons have different reasons it, yeah. it might be for example in the case of dogecoin they saw somebody they look up to tweet about it um maybe somebody in their personal life you know they saw something they see that the banks are adopting it and they're you know there's that little word of mouth it could be the pandemic too the it pandemic could, yes. effect and because it was created in 2008 during the recession right and we're now in another recessionary period correct so. correct so and i guess there's there's also that you know aspect of it that's kind of similar to gold where people some people are using it as a hedge against the broader economic climate so that could be something as well okay well thank you so much darren let's take a look at our next set of presenters and let me introduce our next set of presenters and they may be considered as seasoned in the field of cryptocurrency they've done a great deal of work in building out infrastructure to facilitate this kind of trading and they've made great inroads to supporting local agencies such as the Jamaica Stock Exchange in getting ready to facilitate cryptocurrency. I know a lot of people are waiting on just that very day. So let me tell you who we have next. Marco Heves and Jay Waterman of Block Station will be our next speakers. Marco is a serial entrepreneur and innovator who started his first company at the age of 19 and never looked back. His passion for blockchain technology and the transformative potential of tokenization for financial instruments led him to co-found BlockStation, a leading fintech that has developed the world's first end-to-end platform for compliant listing, trading, clearing, settlement, and custodianship solution of digital assets. Namako works directly with all stakeholders in the securities trade ecosystem, including stock exchanges, depositories, regulators, and broker dealers to enhance their operations, attract quality issuers, increase trading volumes, and bring more investment opportunities to the open market. And then we have Jay. So Jay's mastery is engineering tactical technology to evolve organizations out of legacy systems and processes in order to adopt flexible turnkey solutions. Jay commands the development of technology to create an environment for organizations to compete at a high level. Under his leadership, BlockStation's development team has successfully deployed its technology and suite of products to the stock exchanges depositories, financial institutions, and regulators. So let's introduce Marco and Jay. Let's start with you, Marco. Talk to us about your work in cryptocurrency. How is it changing the face of investing? And what does it mean for the investing public? Yes, absolutely. Um, I mean, when you think about cryptocurrency, you really have to think um, about many other factors that come with it. What is it? Um, Is there regulation around it? yeah, as I was saying, when you think about cryptocurrency, there's many factors that come with it. Um, you know, is it regulated? Is it not regulated? Where is it listed? What is it? How does it change investments? Um, what is next to come? What is it going to evolve to be? And um, this is something that we actually thought about many times, Jay and I, when we uh, got together and um, founded BlockStation, is where is the future going to be with the blockchain and cryptocurrencies? Um, 
I would like to uh, just bring in Jay to this conversation. Jay, can you just go ahead and just introduce yourself first? Hey, Jay Waterman, I'm the CTO and co-founder of Blockstation. So Jay, I just want to say one thing here. I mean, it was 10 years since we had a phone call. Um, and that's when I called you and I said, hey, Jay, you got to look into this blockchain thing and look into this cryptocurrency thing. And at that time, you were not interested. This was, I think, in 2011. So why were you not interested in the blockchain and cryptocurrency at that time? So at, at that time, you had told me about Bitcoin. And I, I had some experience in the past before that with digital currencies. Um, and this is from another business I was in, in the diamond industry. And what was happening is that the merchant service providers for charging, you know, processing credit cards were gouging us because they considered diamonds as high risk business. Um, so we tried to use these digital currencies in order to, you know, reduce some of the fees that we were exposed to. And what ended up happening with that specific digital currency is the company that ran it, their doors were kicked down by the FBI because it's <clears throat> Apparently, you're not supposed to create currencies. That, that's just like. And I, and I remember that time that you said, <laughs> I said, hey, you got to look at this cryptocurrency thing and the blockchain. This was in 2011. You said, no, no, thank you. I don't want to go to jail. And I said that, listen, don't worry, I'll come visit you if you do go to jail. <laughs> but, you know, what I did, what I did at that time is I kept monitoring Bitcoin. Bitcoin in 2011 was, you know, around like, let's say, the five to ten dollars. And the market cap was around one billion dollars. And I kept monitoring Bitcoin all the way up to 2014 and saw a significant growth in Bitcoin going from, you know, one billion to 20 billion dollars. And then, you know, that's when I called you again, because I know your background in software architecture, mastering ERP systems, et cetera. And I really wanted you to be by my side in terms of how we're going to dive into the blockchain and how we can take advantage of this new technology and really evolve it to be something great for the future. And when I called you in 2014, and you no, know, you changed your mind about the blockchain. I think you took a deeper dive. So why is it that at that time you changed your mind in 2014 about the blockchain? So uh, at that time it was because I, as you said, I dove in a little bit deeper and I actually understood how the blockchain works. And when I understood how the blockchain worked, I understood that this is huge efficiencies which are going to transpire across so many different markets that is not going to be able to be stopped. So there's nobody going to be kicking down any doors per se. Um, and the way that the blockchain works, if you could just imagine everybody who's watching this right now, let's say maybe about 200,000 people, all of you guys have a ledger, okay? And are keeping track of every single transaction that happens. So just imagine it's the bank, okay? And we all have a bank account at a specific bank and Marco goes ahead and he does a deposit I go ahead and I do a withdrawal. Everybody's going to record every single transaction that happens in sequence. And since we all are recording the transactions, <clears throat> every time something happens on that blockchain, we call it, we're going to go back and we're going to confirm every single step that happened before to make sure that we're all on the same page. And if somebody you know, says, hey, you know what, Bob did this transaction, but the other 190,000 people are saying, no, no, that, Bob didn't do that transaction. Basically, that person's ledger is going to be ignored and that person, in fact, is going to be penalized. And this is how the blockchain makes sure that the system is immutable, makes sure that the ledger is transparent, secure. And, you know, essentially, this is why every single central bank today, every stock exchange is trying to figure out how can they implement the blockchain in their business. That's right. And... If you're looking at, let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin here, because Bitcoin, I mean, I call it the king of cryptocurrencies because it's the first, the first uh, digital asset that demonstrated how the blockchain can be utilized in terms of how you can transmit value from one party to another, how efficient it is, how fast it is, uncorruptible it is. Um, and, you know, when you think about all these different type of businesses that are involved in record keeping mechanism, Right. And not, not just using it for Bitcoin, but using it for real estate, using it for tokenizing other aspects of ownership to other different types. It could be art, could be music. It's, you know, you, it, the, really, it's uh, endless limits. Right. So to, to uh, what you can do with the, the blockchain. So let's let's take a, a little bit push forward to ICOs. Let's talk a little bit about ICOs. Um, you know, if we're looking at 2017, we have the ICO boom. Right. Everyone was looking about ICOs, talking about ICOs. There was like in 2017, I think 5.6 billion 
I would, yeah, my, my numbers are correct. 5.6 billion raised with ICOs in 2017. In 2018, around $7 billion raised via ICOs. What was it so special about ICOs that allowed them, allowed these companies to raise capital so efficiently and so fast? All right. So first of all, ICO uh, stands for initial coin offering. And this became very popular back in 2016, 17, where people were taking the blockchain protocol and utilizing that technology to create their own coin. It's kind of like, in the, I'm going to call it similar to creating a share of your company, right? And then the way they were raising capital is they were issuing these coins or these shares in return for Bitcoin. And the reason why it was so powerful is because they had a whole global market. So people from across the globe could efficiently and quickly participate in that, you know, that capital raise very easily. So from whether they're in France or Africa or Jamaica or Canada, they could send $50 and participate in your offering and it might cost them 50 cents. I'm going to take that in contrast. For example, if I go to the bank, my, you know, my personal bank, and I want to send a wire to the U.S., it's going to cost me $100. So it cost me $100 to send $100. That immediately totally makes sense. Me. Yeah, so I'm out of it. So basically, the efficiencies that the, the blockchain brings, the ability to transfer that, that cryptocurrency, or that Bitcoin, is what, you know, really drove and supported the this ICO. So we can so we can say that you know what ICOs really demonstrated is the power that the blockchain brings to these companies and how fast and efficient they can raise capital. This is something that was definitely extracted in that moment, but there was a problem. Um, and you know we're ta let's talk about the pain points of these ICOs. First of all, they were not regulated, correct? Yeah, I mean the, they were they were not regulated. It was it was the wild west, right? Of course, regulation normally catches up over time, right? But what happened was, unfortunately, is a lot of these were scams, unfortunately. So these companies would do these ICOs. They would take everybody's money. And the people who bought these coins or bought into these ICOs were not really entitled into, to anything, right? And in contrast of what the JSC is doing with having a fully regulated marketplace, where the same technology can be utilized to have the efficiencies and all the benefits of the blockchain, but without, you know, the problematic aspects when it's the Wild West. That's right, because it wasn't just that the ICOs were not regulated, but, you know, the marketplaces that they were listing on, like these crypto exchanges at the time, also were not regulated. They did not have the right processes and procedures in place, um, not the right protocol. Some of them were being hacked not protecting investors' money accordingly, there's no regulatory oversight, and that was a major, major problem. And this is, you know, at least my view is why we saw in, 20, in 2019, in terms of how ICOs were developing, it was only half a billion dollars raised. There was disbelief in the market to how ICOs operate, and at least myself, what I saw at the time is how security tokens have started to evolve. So companies starting to actually tokenize their securities and basically just, you know, uh, uh, conduct all their business and you know um, corporate actions through the blockchain. So you can say that a security token is pretty much almost like a cryptocurrency, but wrapped with the regulation of the security. Yeah. So like I mean, back in 2014, 15, after we realized you know what the power of this blockchain is, we also understood that this is going to this is going to be what the new securities are are, are going to live on. Like we, we understood that. That's why we started building the ecosystem for that specific purpose. So, you know, if a company wants to issue their securities and raise capital, they can do so by creating, I would call it a smart contract or a token or a coin on the, on the stock exchange uh, and, and, and issue these in a compliant way, right? And raise the capital in a compliant way, utilizing all of that technology. Excellent. You know what? I want to actually take a step back a little bit because I do remember like when we founded Blockstation, we sat down, we said, hey, we're going to utilize this, you know, cutting edge technology, the blockchain and bring it forward to you know, capital markets. And I remember the pain points that we had this is myself also the founder of Blockstation going, you know, like, for example, um, raising capital was not a walk in the park. So if you're a issuer out there and you're listening to this, 
we understand the pain of raising capital. When you're going through and you're, you want to access the right investors. Is it the right investor? You know, you got family and friends, you got angels and all that. And so what is it, what, what do you see that JDAP or the blockchain is, how is it going to facilitate this for issuers coming in? Yeah, so, I mean, there, there's a number of difficulties. So I remember like when we first went to go do our first capital raise, we were trying to raise about a million dollars. $5 million it was. It was $5 million at the time. And, you know, we wanted to go get the, the paperwork prepared from our lawyers. And the cost was in the range of thirty dollars to $50,000 uh, for the paperwork, um, plus, plus, plus. And, <laughs> um, you know, the, they were asking us for all the information to, to create the paperwork, right? So one of the things that we did on the, on the platform, we call it the SLAP, Smart Listing Accelerator Platform. And basically, we have all the predefined clauses, like ready for the, the, the issuers to utilize to create the disclosure, and it's dynamic. So when the issuer goes and fills out their application about their company, how many shares are issued and outstanding, and all the different information about their company and the, the capital raising, how it's going to be used, all this information dynamically is created into their disclosure, into their prospectus. And, the, you know, if you, I don't know if you recall, like uh, one time we were doing uh, our, our disclosure documentation, it was taking some time. We did a small raise in between, right? And we had and, to change everything in the, in the disclosure yeah. documents at the time. Yeah, yeah it was, so that, was a big headache. I remember, I wasn't sure if the, I thought, <laughs> you know, the lawyers were gaming us a little bit because it was like, <laughs> hey, we just, you know, we just changed this, this one number's change, and it's like, oh, that's another 40 hours of work because we got to change all of this. So on our platform, the entire thing would automatically change by just changing that one field. So this is one of the things that really would help the issuers. That's they right. You know, some of the other pain points, like, for example, when, when, you know, when we're raising capital is if you're trying to identify the broker that is the right broker for you, the broker, which we call your champion, that's going to believe in the vision. And, you know, you would, there's, there's no way of actually really getting to know which broker that is going to really believe in that vision right off the bat. Like, I remember actually going and visiting numerous brokers. I go to one broker and they say, well, uh, you know, we don't invest in uh, tech companies. And the other broker would say, well, we invest in tech companies, but you're free revenue. Oh, you know, we invest in, uh, you know, uh, tech companies, but you have to be making over a million dollars, even if you're making revenue. So what's, how is this platform that's utilizing the blockchain or these electronic processes, how would it actually to, you know, help these issuers uh, go through that process? So for the broker and for the issuer, not just for the issuer, right? Because the brokers require that too. They want to also focus on the right uh, issuers that, you know, that within their guidelines. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you got to think of it like a match matchmaking, right? You got to have the, you know, the brokers have their investors and those investors sometimes have a specific profile of what they're looking to invest in, right? And mm -hmm. then you've got the issuer of the company that's trying to raise the capital. They have a specific profile. They're at a specific point in time. So they have to be matched appropriately. So what's powerful about the platform is that when the, when the company goes and enters all their information uh, and they have that disclosure ready, their lawyers have gone through it um, or started going through it, they can do what we call initiate the, the offering, right? And when they initiate it, it opens it up so that the brokers can see. So for example, uh, VM, can go in, look at the different offerings that are there from the issuers and say, you know what, this one fits our criteria. They can actually see right away and actually filter only the ones that fit and match their criteria. So once they got that, now they can go in and, and start building a relationship with that company to help them along the process of doing a, a digital or tokenized IPO. That's, that's, that sounds great. And then we have, um, you know, I'm just going to bring up one more pain point that I really had here because I remember also managing the, the investors and I still do, right? Yeah, you know, assist, you know, uh, um, the company managing the investors and the shareholders and the cap table. So we're talking about record keeping. Here. So this is like where really it goes hand in hand with the blockchain, right? Record keeping is where it's at really immutability. So how, how does the platform help issuers with that process, at least removing that administrative burden, like letting them focus on the business and actually managing, managing the cap ledger. Right, so I mean, you know, a lot of companies will manage their share ledger on that Excel spreadsheet. And, you know, sometimes that spreadsheet might, you know, 
um, get adjusted in the wrong way, or maybe they've issued some shares and they forgot to update the sheet. Uh, a lot of different things happen, and, and as a result, sometimes the record keeping is not perfect, and this is not ideal. Um, so what's powerful to, about the blockchain is when you issue those shares or those securities to somebody, you do it on the blockchain. And so a transaction will be broadcasted to the blockchain, which is transparent to everyone. It's transparent to the broker, it's transparent to the stock exchange, the depository, the investors. Everybody knows what that real-time market cap is. I remember I was talking to one of the stock exchanges here in Canada, and they said that I would be surprised at the amount of times that you know a company, uh, for example, in Canada, has issued some shares without notifying the stock exchange, right? And so the market cap is not reflected accurately sometimes, you know, in real time in, in that kind of a circumstance, right? So what will happen on the blockchain is once those shares are issued, it's in real time, right? So it's, it's again, just the efficiency and the accuracy, as well as nobody can accidentally change it. You know, everything is, is very tight. Excellent. So, I mean, we're, I think we're running out of time here, but I want to I want to bring up one more topic here and talk about what's next. We talk about the ICO. Or, well, actually, we're talking about the pain points that a lot of issuers would encounter when they're raising capital and how the blockchain can really facilitate capital raises, um, how it can facilitate, uh, you know, how the platform, the block station platform can um, allow the issuers to, um, you know, identify the right brokers for them when they're raising capital, as well as how the blockchain can really facilitate how they can manage their share ledger and so on. And what I was going to get right into is for you entrepreneurs out there, the issuers out there, um, you know, to know what's coming next. We talked about the past, you know, the blockchain, how it was developed. We talked about cryptocurrencies and ICOs. What is next? What is the next big thing that we're going to see? So Jay, I'd like you to just, you know, what's your, what's your projection? What's your prediction for the next big thing? <laughs> Well, it's, it's easy to predict. <laughs> the next big, big thing is the JSC going live and you're going to have a flood of different companies because of the efficiencies. You're going to see a flood of companies. Internationally, we're going to be listing on the Jamaica Stock Exchange, right? We have a Victoria Mutual who's going to be helping a lot of these issuers to go through and, and set up their, their capital raise. And you're going to see, you know, uh, a lot of uh, investors from across the globe who are so excited because this is going to be basically the first time we're on a national stock exchange that people across the world can participate in a digitized tokenized IPO, right? So all of the great exciting moments of the ICO days, but with all the safety and regulation of a regulated environment. It's like That's the best of the both worlds coming together. Not massively exciting, seeing all this massive adoption in this space. And let's not forget also that the, you know, the JSE allowing the listing of Bitcoin and Ethereum, having that listed on the platform. Um, you know, just think about this. Bitcoin and Ethereum alone, $2 trillion in market cap. I think surpassing that right now. These investors that, you know, are holding Bitcoin and Ethereum where they're trading it, they're looking for attractive, you know, new investments. Right, they're looking for all these different exciting investments, whether it's on the JSE or another stock exchange. So, the ability for the uh, the JSE to go first here and launch this product, allowing these companies to do a tokenized IPO, and at the same time, you know, having Bitcoin and Ethereum listed on the on the J, uh, on the JSE is going to drive in, out, at least my prediction and my view, drive in a lot of liquidity and really facil facilitate the capital raises for these issuers. For sure, definitely. Excellent. So, I mean, I think we're running out of time right now, but I mean, it's great that we spoke about the past, the present, and we spoke about the future. I'd like to thank our audience for uh, staying tuned. And I hope that this conversation between Jay and I and our journey from the evolution of the blockchain all the way to what it is right now has benefited you in so many ways. And if you know, if you, if you want to understand more about the qualifications and how you would qualify to list on the JSC via, you know, as a tokenized IPO, go to blockstation.com slash STO, and you'll get actually all the criteria that uh, that would qualify you 
uh, as an issuer to list on the JSC. Thank you so much for your time and we're ready to take your questions right now. So we're actually going to be taking questions at the end of the presentation. So when all the other, all the other presenters have made their points and made their presentations, then we will take the questions. But very good presentation from Marco and Jay. Darren, did I hear them right? This will be the first time that funds are being raised in this way in the world? Yes, yes, in our regulated environment. So they're doing actually very important work for not just our local market, but you know, on a, on a global scale. It's good for the ecosystem. Big things pop in on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Well, somebody who knows a little bit about that is our next presenter. And uh, that person is joining us from the Jamaica Stock Exchange, which is the forerunner in our local market and actively working towards facilitating trading in cryptocurrency. This innovation has placed Jamaica ahead much of the Caribbean and now I'm hearing ahead much of the world as well. So we're eager to hear about the work being done by the FSC, the regulator, the Financial Services Commission. Our guest is Kadil McNaught Hermit. She's the manager of the Registrar and Depository Services Unit at the Jamaica Central Securities Depository Limited. That's the JCSD, which is a subsidiary of the JSE, the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Her responsibilities include providing registrar, transfer, and capital distribution services to her issuer clients, which also includes paying dividends to shareholders. In addition, she's also responsible for the custody and settlement of securities that are listed on the JSC. She's been working in the financial services industry for over 18 years. So let's welcome Cadill McNaught Hermit. Hi, Cadill. Hi, Kalila. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me on this forum. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, the JSC's digital asset platform or the JSC's digital asset market. And I just want to make sure that you are seeing my presentation. All right. Thank you so much. So as I said before, I'm going to be looking at the JSC's digital asset market. And uh, before even going into my presentation, I want to just give you a definition for digital assets. And a digital asset is a cryptographical secured digital representation of a set of rights provided on a digital platform issued or created for commercial exploitation or reward, and which are exchanged and traded or cleared on a digital securities platform. That's a lot, but it's basically we know the different types of digital assets, um, you're so familiar with the digital currencies. We have been speaking about them since um, this forum started. Um, so you have Bitcoin, you have Ethereum, and there are others. There are security tokens as another type of digital asset. And that's really virtual tokens that have features and characteristics of a security, such as a share. And then there are other types of digital assets, such as derivatives and collective investment funds of digital assets. Now, I want to point out that for the JSC's digital asset market, um, we will be focusing on or it will be based on the use of a blockchain technology because not all digital assets um, trade using the blockchain technology. So the introduction by the JSC will be based on the use of blockchain technology, which centers around the decentralization of the ledger. And as assets are moved, they are moved directly from seller to buyer. And this mitigates many risks, such as interruption of transfer, and it decreases the likelihood of any fraud. Now, why did JSE choose to, be, to have a digital asset market? Or why are we looking to launch a digital asset market? Technological innovation is transforming the financial services industry. And so the JC is not going to be left behind. We are embracing this innovation to meet broker dealer and investor demand to trade digital assets. We also see this as an opportunity to improve those um, opportunities for raising capital, especially for small and medium sized companies. And of course, it will unlock the transformative potential of digital assets across global markets and commerce. Many exchanges worldwide, they have been entering the space and they have been saying, listen, um, we have an interest in supporting digital assets on the platform. 
And those you've heard this from Gibraltar Stock Exchange, you've heard this from Malta Stock Exchange, Toronto Stock Exchange, NASDAQ. And so JSC is not going to be left behind. And we are ensuring that we take digital assets mainstream in Jamaica, leveraging our trusted regulatory efficiency. Now, let's take a little look at uh, the JSC's approach to the digital assets. What we are providing is a turnkey solution that utilizes the blockchain to enhance trade life cycle and methods of operations while maintaining high regulatory and compliance standards for which we are known. The solution that we're offering, and Jay and Marcus spoke to it earlier, it will is really a comprehensive solution. It will have a regulator, it will allow for regulatory oversight for a safe, efficient, and transparent marketplace. There will be features to list, features to trade and set a digital assets, as well as providing business continu continuity. And of course, in keeping with security, there will be audit trails which provide tracking mechanism for all transactions. We partnered with the Block Station and we have been in partnership with them since 2017 in trying in creating this market because we want to provide an end-to-end -end compliance platform. And I will speak a little bit more about this later in my presentation. And uh, we definitely intend to launch this product in 2021. Now, there are a number of things that uh, we had to do to get uh, this, the market ready. And we had to look at the environment for the use of the technology. So one of the things that we did, and we started this process from 2017, we started to end. And in my next slide, I will um, go a little bit more in the stakeholders. But what we did, we created a steering committee. And the steering committee included brokers, regulators, and other stakeholders. And there were certain things that were key to success. And those included development of the rules, the JC rules, and getting a no objection letter from the FSC. Our rules will really mimic the, the, the current JSE rules because we are trading assets. So uh, we have mimicked the JSC trading rules. And uh, we have made decisions as it relates to settlement time frame. So one of the things that we'll be doing in our regular markets, um, we have a T plus two settlement cycle, but on the digital asset market, we'll be having a T plus one settlement cycle. We have amended current broker and participant procedures and agreements. And also the brokers will have to be registered with the FSC because um, we're with the other markets, um, the brokers, as long as uh, they have been, they are a licensed financial um, service advisor or a licensed um, dealer, and they have been, they are a licensed member dealer as well, they are able to trade. But with the digital asset market, there is an additional layer where they have to be registered to trade on the digital asset market. Now, let's look at the stakeholders in a little bit more detail. So I just spoke to the member dealers who will have to be registered with the FSC to trade in digital assets. But there is also the Companies Office of Jamaica. And we know that when you are taking a, a security to market, you'll have to register those um, securities with the, the financial service, not financial service, sorry, Companies Office of Jamaica. So that will still be a requirement. It's a securities and assets. So um, for all assets, you will have to register with the company's office of Jamaica. And then there's the Financial Services Sex, um, Commission. And the Financial Services Commission, again, you'll have to register the securities and get the, the necessary um, approvals. We have to have a settlement bank to facilitate the settlement of fiat. There will be issuers, of course, who will be issuing um, the securities, they will be raising capital, and Marco and Jay spoke to that in their presentations with the offering of digital assets. And of course, most importantly, we have the investors who will be investing in the digital asset market. And we have Blockstation. Now let's look a little bit on a Blockstation. Why did we choose Blockstation? 
Of course, Blockstation is uh, one of the few fintech companies that offers an end-to-end -end compliant platform, which mimics the traditional trade cycle ecosystem. At the same time, they utilize the power of the blockchain. And remember earlier in my presentation, I said that was very important for us. So they utilize the power of the blockchain to enhance operations while improving transparency all within a regulatory framework. And that was key to us because, you know, we are key about transparency. We are key about um, just ensuring efficiency. And so that was very important to us. Now, Blockstation's digital asset platform supports the full role of all stakeholders, including the exchange, the depository, the brokers, the regulators, the issuers, and the investors. If we had chosen any other provider, then we would have needed to integrate many solutions so that we would um, be able to provide this, this kind of a product. And that would cause a continued risk. If we were to have to integrate with you know all these different solutions it could cause a number of risks because so there could be continuity risk of course there's uncertainty of the responsible party when issues occur there is an expensive expense to it and it may have um, implications for integration in terms of time and 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 um, implementation so choosing block station though the, these were very key for us in choosing block station we also looked at creating an, an environment for the use of the technology. So we looked at risk mitigation strategies, we looked at technology and we looked at operations. I know that once people hear digital assets, they start thinking about security. So that was something that we looked at in great detail. And further in my presentation, I will take you through the security features that we have. We all, another um, key risk mitigation strategy was AML and KYC. Uh, we had to ensure that the same amount of visibility that the regulators have or regulator watchdogs have now, they will still have over the digi digital asset market platform and the market in general. So um, in creating this environment, we had to make sure that uh, these two RMOD and the FSC were given full view of the, of the market. We had to look at settlement risk mitigation so we have implemented those strategies um, to ensure that there is little or to reduce any set settlement risk that we might have. And of course, there's that opportunity for continuous review and continuous improvement. There were some challenges as well that we have to work through and have been working through and still have to. So we have to get full acceptance. We have to look at the measurements, evaluations. How do you value digital assets? and the ratings on balance sheets. And of course, there's the issue of taxation. So I'm now gonna go into the ecosystem for um, the digital asset market. Now, I said earlier that it's a end-to-end -end, um, platform that um, Blockstation has provided and we have uh, adopted. So the JSC, JSC's digital asset, asset market platform is really a full house. We have an issuer compliant listing platform. What does that mean? It enables our issuers or prospective issuers to input their data and tokenize their security. So they can do that from the platform. It allows for a simple click through prospectus filing. And after that process is complete, then submission to the JSC and the FSC for their approvals. There's a stock exchange admin portal. And this is really a flexible user interface, which the JSC will use to manage brokers and to monitor market activity. There's an order matching system. It allows uh, uh, the JSC to, and the brokers and their investors to process trades, receive live streaming quotes, and accurately reconcile their execution reports for timely settlement. So these are the same things that we have in our traditional market. And I, I keep saying that what we try to do is to ensure that pretty much the same features that you have in the regular market, secure um, in the regular stock market is the same kind of thing that you'll be seeing in the, in the um, digital asset market, but more enhanced using the blockchain. 
So there's also a custodian admin, admin um, portal, and that's used by the depository. And that is really an end-to-end -end solution for the secure clearing and settlement of digital assets. There's a broker admin portal. The broker portal enables the FSC registered member dealers, and I keep stressing that, um, the ability to manage their traders as well as the process of raising capital. There's a trader portal, and of course, the brokers will be using that trader portal to manage their investors and their activities. There's an investor portal, and I know the investors are, will be very happy for this because the investor is provided with this portal to trade digital assets. And also, not only to trade digital assets, but also the, the whole process of, of registering for an account with their broker. There's an integrated KYC solution. The platform enables the broker to conduct customer due diligence on their investors, as well as AML background checks. And I'm going to do a slide on that shortly. So let's look at a, a diagram of the ecosystem. Uh, what you'll see, you'll see the investors who are buying and selling, and you'll see the broker dealer. So that doesn't change. The investor will still go through the broker dealer. You see the stock exchange in the middle, and there's the market maker. Um, and so you see the JCSD um, there. So the, the trading takes place on the platform. The stock exchange has side, side oversight of it. The market maker is there ensuring liquidity. And the JCSD depository is there um, for settlement and signing of the raw transactions. And um, clearing and settlement includes, it's a little bit more engaging than the, what we are used to, but all of this is for uh, the security. And this is really just how the blockchain works, um, but it makes it so much more secure. Um, the signing of the raw transactions by tri-party signatories and um, the broadcast on the blockchain. I've been saying security, security, security. So let's talk a little bit more and delve into what are the security features that the digital asset um, platform will have. We have a comprehensive risk management principle and protocol that is embedded in the platform that will mitigate risk of theft, loss, cybersecurity, and collusion. So what you, we have is a platform that is impossible to hack using simple logic because we have offline keys. The digital assets are stored in, is, uh, the digital assets are in 100% cold storage and private keys that never go online. So if it's not online, it cannot be hacked. And that is one of the things that make the, this platform so secure because uh, we, use 100% cold storage and private keys, which never go online. Cold storage vaults are multi-sig with five keys spread across different organizations to broadcast transactions. So this, it's not only the stock exchange that has keys for the signing and the keys here are for the signing of the transactions, um, but it is spread across multiple um, organizations and actually require Three, at least three persons to sign those transactions before it can be broadcasted. There are multiple layers of authentication and authorization, and we have 100% insurance on the digital asset vault. And in addition to that, there are role-based permissions. So um, there is a, a, um, each person, depending on their responsibility, they will have um, their access based on, on responsibility. Risk management is very important to us. And in looking at risk, we want to protect the investor. We want to ensure market integrity. We want to ensure market efficiency. And we want to ensure that there's a regulator portal. So we looked at some of the potential risks and we looked at the risk mitigation method. We looked at market manipulation. What do we have to prevent market manipulation? There is self-trade prevention. There's a self-trade prevention feature that automatically identifies trades that cross with themselves and cancel either the new order, old order, or both orders. Another risk, order sequencing. 
And these are risk um, um, as it relates to the trading of the securities. So what do we have to prevent order sequencing? All orders, orders are processed through a messaging queue, which are sent to the exchange engine in a chronological order and matched in priority sequence based on the date and time of the order. Then there's retail order priority. Every order has an associated account with its professional or retail status, which enables the exchange engine to fill the retail orders before professional orders. You are used to client and, and house accounts. And um, with the digital assets, we will have uh, retail and professional. So the retail orders will be given priority over professional orders when the bid or offer is the same price. Then there's front running because front running is a risk, is a potential risk. So what do we have in place on this platform? There's no way to jump the queue as all orders are processed through a messaging queue, as I said before, which are sent to the exchange in, a, in chronological order and matched in priority sequence based on the date and time of the order. In addition, there are blotter reports that contain all order records with timestamp. So the compliance departments for each of the brokers, uh, they can identify suspicious activities such as um, front running their clients' orders. In addition to that, there is also um, the risk management tools that are in place for KYC and AML. Now, the KYC and the AML process is conducted by globally recognized and trusted third party. So we have uh, um, for AML, we have um, Chainwatch and Synapse and, and KYC, we have Synapse. And Chainwatch, what does Chainwatch do? Chainwatch is an interactive blockchain um, discovery, discovery tool that helps regulated institutions conduct AML due to to conduct email due diligence against deposits received from their clients. So, you know, you might have some um, watch list and uh, you want to ensure that the funds, because remember with this digital asset platform, we, won't, we will have local investors, we will have um, foreign investors. And what we want to make sure is that, uh, you know, the platform is able to track or to ensure um, that uh, KYC and AML standards are, are, are maintained. So what uh, um, Chainwatch will do, it, it, it will be checking the government database, it will be checking the global watch list, it will be checking the global sanctions to see if uh, the funds that were, that were involved or that were sent for any particular transaction um, where it originated or at any point of the transaction, if uh, any of those um, countries or, or so on are on any of the government database or global watch list or the global sanction list. And it will send, it will, it will um, give an alert or it will show um, the brokers that the brokers are able to, to, you know, have that as a tool for their AML. The Synapse um, in, assists in the KYC. So um, the investors are able to, as I said earlier, go onto the platform and they are able to register for their account. They are submitting their TIDs and other documents. And what will happen is that identity, ver identity verification will be done um, using Synaps, um document authenticity, facial recognition and all of those. So the te technology is really there to assist with the KYC and the AML process. Now, as I said, we have been working on this for some time now, and we recognize that in working on uh, this market, we had to ensure that we not only had the platform um, that was operating at the standard that is expected, but we also needed to have the documents in place. So we went ahead and we created and modified a number of documents um, that would be relevant for this market. So of course, we have our gold standard JC rulebook um, that uh, was created. Um, we have our stock exchange standard operating procedures. We have the depository standard operating procedures. And I spoke about the private keys earlier. Which, is, which are all a part of the whole security feature. We have a private key management document. 
there we have a compliance checklist. These are all of the things that must be there um, um, to, to onboard a client. We have procedures for listing securities. We have um, a JC market maker rules, which say, you know, who can be a market ruler, which company can be a market ruler and so on. There's the JC market maker agreement. We have fee schedules and we have broker standard operating procedures. There is a digital asset investment account on board checklist. And we also have digital asset broker agreements. So we really have been putting a lot into ensuring that this digital asset market is, 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 is foolproof and will deliver a fair, a transparent and efficient market. Um, we are looking forward to it. As I said earlier in the presentation, this is something that we are looking to launch in 2021. So we are really working with our stakeholders and just ensuring that the digital asset market is at the standard. And um, really, we are just excited about launching this product. So that's it for me for now. I'm Kalilo, just taking you through a look at our digital asset um, market. Thank you so much, Kadil. This is such exciting stuff. I mean, I don't know if everybody fully grasps the, the depth of what is about to happen here in Jamaica in 2021, because people are so excited about the cryptocurrency space, about digital assets, and it's just been so difficult to make that type of investment. You run into problems trying to fund your coin wallet, the banks blocking the transactions. And so this is going to revolutionize this entire space. So I'm looking forward to that launch whenever that is. Well, somebody who can now tell us a bit more about this is Mr. Everton McFarlane. So he was appointed Executive Director effective August 2, 2017. They're at the Financial <laughs> Services Commission, the FSC. He leads the executive management team in executing the FSC's mandate to deliver a balanced, consistent, and effective regulatory program that will inspire confidence in Jamaica's financial system. So, Mr. McFarlane, thank you so much for joining us. Well, our involvement, um, big, well, I wouldn't say began, but certainly um, was intensified as part of the process by which the Jamaica Stock Exchange um, came to develop its, its, its digital asset trading platform. Um, from early on in the game, the, the Stock Exchange engaged us as a, as a partner in, in, in the process. Um, we have had uh, numerous interactions um, on this particular issue. We have had uh, training sessions uh, with Jamaica Stock Exchange, we have had um, you know meetings with Blackstation as the as the as 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 as, as the major service provider um, for the architecture. You know, taking us through the features of the of, of the platform, and in fact, you know, sitting down and, and and talking to us about what were the regulatory touch points that needed to be addressed um, as far as the architecture was concerned, and and ensuring that those features were. Were, were built in um, as the platform as the as the as the ecosystem was being built out. Also, the development of the stock exchange rules was something that the FSC um, was involved in. By virtue of our function as the regulator of the stock exchange, we are we are obligated to review um, the uh, stock exchange rules and to offer our non-objection. And during that iterative process. I think we were able to establish a framework that combined um, that allowed um, for the benefits of 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 um, digital asset trading in terms of efficiency and 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 security to um, to come before, whilst at the same point in time satisfying certain regulatory concerns we had as it related to um, to you know satisfying certain AML. Um, considerations in terms of knowing your clients um, and being able to um, ensure that the workers understood an obligation that they had to, um, to properly assessing suitability of investing in, in, in cryptocurrencies, sorry, in, in, in virtual assets. 
as a as a as a as a as a means for investors, but not necessarily for all investors. And the process by which that those obligations were going to be met was something that we had had also discussed. Um, so we have we have we have tried to support the market development in a prudent way. Um, we have published an advisory with some um, regulatory requirements that um, essentially speaks to requirements that brokers and other participants um, should be adhering to if, if the FSC is to give its non-objection to the registration of a security to be traded as a digital asset on the JC platform. As well too, we have to be satisfied that the, that the requirements of the JC rules are being adhered to. Um, you know, the rules are binding on, on, on participants as long as they remain participants. And so that's an important compliant tool for us. Um, looking ahead, we are, well, so far we have, taken a, a kind of incremental approach where we are focusing on giving um, mainly on trading across a recognized exchange that has um, satisfied certain features as it relates to compliance, risk management, security, um, airmail, um, um, compliance, and, and, and so on. However, virtual assets are not only you know, um, the universe of all these um, can be traded, um, we recognize um, has to be broader. And so we are in the process of, of thinking about a broader set of regulations that will, that will guide this. And certainly over the next several months, we are gonna, hopefully we can be um, engaging the public, um, engaging our stakeholders more directly in, in the consultation around these regulations. And, and I, I guess for now, that's all I have to say. Um, I, you know, so, some of these matters are addressed in the presentation that I have. Um, and so, you know, I'm just pleased to be able to have this opportunity to share, uh, to share with you and your guests. So, so just very quickly, um, you know, as, as previous uh, presenters have noted, you know, by way of background, uh, you know, financial technology has really brought about a paradigm shift in the way that investment takes place. And whilst investors have been acquainted with various means of electronic payments, you know, bank transfers, credit and debit cards, e-money, um, crypto asset investment is emerging as kind of a one of a one of a kind addition to the entire digital transaction experience, pri primarily because of the way that it combines efficiency with security as well as global access. And according to um, Statista.com, the cumulative market capitalization of crypto assets trading grew approximately 300% in 2020 to something over 758 billion US. Um, they, so, so that's evidence that you know globally there are increasing number of persons who are who are taking advantage of opportunities to invest um, and trade in crypto assets and brokers and trading platforms around the world um, are you know entering this arena um, to take advantage of, of of the opportunity that exists and to ensure that um, there is a, a more structured environment. Um, that can facilitate persons who are interested in buying and selling crypto assets and, 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 and tokens. However, there are two, at least two, 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 two fundamental impediments to stock exchanges worldwide. And I'm focusing on, on, on stock exchanges because that is the, that's the arena um, that currently the, currently the FSC is comfortable addressing um, the trading of, of, of digital assets here in Jamaica, right? And stock exchanges worldwide um, face with at least two fundamental impediments um, to the trading of digital assets on their, on, their, on, their, on their platform, namely the lack of a requisite legal and regulatory framework 
and the and, and, and issues to do with adequate technological solutions. And has has been explained by both um, the presenters from Dock Station and by Kadil, um, the Jamaica Stock Exchange has found a way to address in 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 consultation with us, um, right, to address those two um, those two issues. But in addition to those two obstacles, there are there are a couple other things I want to bring to the attention of, of investors in, 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 in general. Um, namely that due to the complexity and, and the rapidly evolving nature of, of digital asset creation, there is a need to constantly assess any existing regulation to ensure that it can be effectively applied to the various types of digital assets that are being created or if amendments need to be made. And, and secondly, that by, by the nature of the, of the beast, um, various classifications of, of virtual assets are sometimes difficult to understand for the average investor. And, um, you know, and, and this contributes to um, issues of, 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 of complexity and, and fragmentation of markets across jurisdiction. Now in 2018, as, as you have been told, uh, the JC partnered with Dock Station to provide an end-to-end -end compliant platform to facilitate uh, crypto assets trading in Jamaica. And that platform supports the full role of all stakeholders, including the exchange, the depository, the brokers, regulators, mm -hmm. issuers, and investors. Um, just focusing a little bit on, 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 on the FSC requirements. Um, uh, trading in securities can only occur across a platform that is operated by a recognized stock exchange as defined in, in the Securities Act. And the JC is one such recognized exchange. And pursuant to Section 26 of the Securities Act, um, we require that each issuer of securities, including digital assets, will be required to register that security with the Financial Services Commission um, before being offered to the public. Now, um, the, 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 the details of those registration requirements have been elaborated in an advisory um, that was published in, in December 2019 and can be found on our website. Among other things, the advisory gives guidance on the definition of, 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 of digital assets and outlines certain requirements for, for key stakeholders, including securities dealers and market makers. With regards to securities dealers, and I'm moving fairly quickly because I want to allow for as much time as possible for questions. With regards to securities dealers, um, dealers who intend to offer uh, digital assets or, or digital currencies on behalf of their clients are required to receive approval from the FSC prior to engaging in this activity. And in order to do so, they have to submit a particular registration form that's outlined as part of the advisory and most importantly, they have to uh, prepare um, an information circular that provides information on the particular currency coin or asset that it intends to register with the FSC. And the advisor gives certain features of the, of the asset that needs to be explained to investors um, as, part of that, as, as part of that circular so that investors can understand the origin of the asset um, as well as how um, you know, the assets um, integrity is, it is intended to be maintained. Uh, as part of our mandate to protect investors and to keep and to ensure that market integrity is, is maintained, um, in order for us to give our approval to securities dealers with regards to the issuance of a digital asset, there are certain things that we require um, that dealer to provide, including um, risk management and compliance policies that address specifically digital asset and currency trading. You know, how is the dealer going to ensure that it has processes and, and systems in place to deal with risk management and ensure compliance? Um, most importantly, um, the, the dealer must demonstrate um, enhanced AML and CFT procedures and controls. And there must be policies in place that indicate um, you know, how periodic surveillance and, 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 and reporting of trading activities are to take place. 
and dealers must maintain a segregated account to hold client funds who participate in digital asset trading. Importantly, at this point in time, securities dealers are not allowed to hold uh, proprietary positions in any form of digital currency, but we hold digital assets approved by the SS, by the FSC. And, and that particular allowance um, pays respect to the fact that in order for the trading of digital assets to have a dynamic market, um, there needs to be um, you know, ready buyers and, and sellers on both sides of the market. And, 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 and we believe that um, brokers can play a role in, in that respect. Dealers are required to assess their clients' eligibility for trading in digital assets. This is just an extension of a standard obligation on the part of dealers to assess suitability of investment opportunities for their clients. Right? It's no different from what um, from assessing suitability for investment in other kinds of securities. But based on the nature of digital assets, the newness, um, the volatility of those markets, I think there's a particularly strong obligation on the part of dealers to ensure that their clients are have the capacity and the understanding to take the risks involved in investing in uh, digital assets. And they must secure a declaration signed by each investor indicating that he or she fully understands um, the risks. Essentially, what we're looking to start off in terms of the investor base is, is, is kind of a broadened, I would say a broadened concept of a sophisticated investor. Um, we already have a definition of a credited investor that is quite that has become quite established in, in our local jurisdiction. And in addition to that category, we have also um, you know, uh, taken on board the fact that there are investors out there who are uh, professional traders who may not be a, a, an accredited investor, or they may be in investors who have particular training and experience um, you know, by virtue of their own history of trading in digital assets. And, and for us at the FSC, certainly in the initial stages, in the embryonic stages of, of digital asset trading, that's the kind of universe of investors that I believe should, should be um, you know, encouraged or you know, um, you know, given um, the opportunities to invest in digital assets. Digital asset investment is not for everyone. And there is a responsibility on the part of each individual investor to very carefully consider their capacity and their appetite for taking on the risks involved here. We also um, make provision in our advisory for oversight of, of what are called market makers. So market makers are service providers who are contracted to provide liquidity, very important, to uh, provide liquidity to the market and to establish quotes for bid ask prices for exchange listed assets, including virtual assets. And by doing so, they reveal prices that they are willing to buy or sell at, and this facilitates price discovery and liquid trading so that investors in digital assets can be assured that you know, if they want to sell at a particular point in time, that sale can occur without a significant impact on the price at which it is being sold. And similarly, if they want to buy, um, they are not faced with significant volatility in prices simply by virtue of their own transaction because they have sufficient liquidity in the market and there's a market maker standing by on both sides of that transaction. Market makers are required to register with the FSC by submitting the following an executed Jamaica Stock Exchange market maker application and the, and the required documents that are, 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 are to uh, make that um, process uh, valid, a copy of the executed Jamaica Stock Exchange market maker agreement, and confirmation approval um, by the Jamaica Stock Exchange. We also require market makers to have letters of good standing from a home regulator if the home regulator is not the FSC. And of course, the FSC will conduct fit and proper assessments of, of owners, directors, and senior officers of the market makers in, in line with our 
um, general regulatory responsibilities. And of course, security dealers um, are required to submit various reports to the FSC um, in terms of us understanding what has happened during the onboarding process, as well as um, certain aspects of the trading activities, not of individual clients, but of the portfolio. Finally, I, I just want to point out that, um, that the framework that we have established by virtue of the 2019 advisory is not the be all and end all. Um, we may and we intend to issue and publish additional legislative changes which shall be binding on digital asset service providers. And these changes will have additional requirements or, or may have additional requirements and conditions and may further clarify our requirements for any segment of the market. Um, I just want to close by just reiterating that it is incumbent on financial institutions and on dealers to equip their client advisors um, with the proper training in relation to crypto assets so that those advisors can provide the necessary guidance to the, uh, to the investors. Um, and finally, I just want to emphasize that virtual assets like any other um, security, um, confidence, I should say, in, in, in virtual assets, like any other um, securities underpinned, amongst other things, by regulatory clarity and the robustness of the systems that are in place to govern the trading of that security that ensures safety and security. And I believe that the work that has been done by the Jamaica Stock Exchange over the last three years, in consultation and discussion with a wide range of stakeholders in the dealer community, with service providers such as Blockstation and with the regulator such as the FSC, has, has achieved um, a combination of, of, of safety and security. And um, as a result, um, there is no investment, you know, there is no investment or a system that um, is ever, you know, 100% safe from operational risks. But certainly, um, I believe the ecosystem in place by the JSE is, is, you know, as strong as any other around the world. It's, it's world class. And with that, I just want to say thank you. And I look forward to your questions. Everton, so I know that we've given you a whole lot of information here today, and I know that you are ready to ask your question. So let me just set the stage for that. Let me lay out uh, sort of the ground rules for how you can ask your questions. And our team, of course, is ready to answer those questions. Just place them in the chat and indicate if you have a particular presenter that you would like to answer that question. Now, if we cannot cover your question in this session, we will note and respond via email or via our social channels. So what you should do is ensure that your contact is available to us. So you can send via DM or you can also email and the team will respond. So our first question actually goes out to you, Everton McFarlane. I think you would be the, the appropriate person to, to answer this one. Will cryptocurrency gains be taxed at the same rate as capital gains? Do you know? Yeah, sorry. Yes, I, I couldn't be the appropriate authority um, to address that um, question. But by virtue, um, whatever tax framework that, that governs trading on the stock exchange currently, I, I believe will apply to trading in a cryptocurrency, unless there is a specific um, change in the tax legislative framework that looks specifically at, 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 at virtual assets. Um, that's the best answer that I can do. I'm not aware of any specific, um, you know, of any special tax regime for, for, for crypto assets versus other forms of assets traded on the global stock exchange. 
question for the politicians because that's a policy question as to what is going to be taxed and at what rate. So when that time comes, we ask the appropriate uh, persons in charge of policy to respond to that question. So let me throw this one out to Cadill McNaught uh, Kermit then. And this is another interesting question. How does crypto benefit a corporate entity? How does cryptocurrency benefit a, a corporate entity? Uh, well, uh, um, in terms of it would be based on uh, the trading of, of, of the cryptocurrency or the benefits that come with the, the trading of the cryptocurrency. Uh, because um, the if you were to say digital assets, if you were to widen it now and say how oh, digital assets um, would benefit the company, would benefit an, an, a company, well, they could, uh, of course, issue uh, a token um, and to raise capital. Uh, so that would be the, the, the way that a company would benefit. If they want to raise capital, they can issue a token, a digital asset, uh, backed by a security. Um, to to raise capital, but in terms of uh, um, the digital currency, you now um, the benefits that you derive um, would basically be from uh, whatever benefits you get from trading it. To add something to that, Darren, um, I can. So um, I agree with what she says as far as the the benefits from you know the the ease of raising capital and all of that. That's that's definitely something that can be revo revolutionary for a market. Um, as it relates to uh, a direct investment, um, how a company can benefit. So, so this is not really something that, you know, is going to be a part of the run-of-the-mill liquidity operation of, of most companies, even companies that are involved in investment. Um, I would say that for a company involved in investment, if you have a what's called a surplus portfolio, um, this might be something that, you know, you can look at for that side of your portfolio, something that, you know... Um, a portion of your portfolio that you're you're looking at things like venture capital investment, high, higher risk type of investments, because again, this is still a fairly early stage development. It's a high risk in, in investment, so it, it it wouldn't be something that I would recommend as part of the run run of the mill investments at that level. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me bring Jay and Marco back in. Uh, kind of an easy question, or maybe not so easy. I don't know. It depends on where you are. So from here in Jamaica, I don't know. Can you purchase goods and services with cryptocurrency? Either one of you can take that. Um, sure. Um, so can you purchase goods and services with cryptocurrencies? Are you referring like, well, there's many, many e-commerces right now that actually offer um, payment methods through Bitcoin and Ethereum. If you just, you know, um, just follow up with what's happening with PayPal. They actually just embedded, you know, allowing um, their users to pay with Bitcoin and Ethereum. There's many, many organizations out there that are starting to allow Bitcoin and Ethereum to be as a payment method to uh, basically provide their services with. So yes, you could uh, purchase goods and services with cryptocurrencies like Bitcoin and Ethereum and some other ones that are, uh, you know, adopted by these companies. I think also that I think Tesla recently actually is going right. to accepting uh, cryptocurrency as payment for if you want to buy a Tesla. And also I'll just like to add to what Kadil was saying in terms of another benefit for a company raising capital. Uh, you know, one of the, the benefits of how cryptocurrency can actually benefit the company is when you're raising capital, you have a, a wider net of investors that you can actually reach. So I want you just to consider in Jamaica, imagine there's somebody in France or in Africa who wanted to, you know, invest a hundred dollars in, in, in your company while you're doing your capital raise. If they were going to send over cash, it's going to cost them maybe a hundred dollars to send a hundred dollars, which makes it, takes them out of the equation. But when you're dealing with something like Bitcoin, they could send a hundred dollars with a Bitcoin that's going to cost them, you know, pennies. And now some, suddenly you've just opened up your, your offering to so many more people to participate. There are talks within the Jamaican banking sector about accepting crypto as a legal tender in Jamaica? As far as I'm aware, um, the bank has not sanctioned the currency in Jamaica. I think you're breaking up a, a little bit. Kadil, are you able to offer any insight on that? Are there talks about accepting cryptocurrency as legal tender? You know, I would I would want to address that question um, certainly with my colleague at the bank. Um, 
you know, rather than trying to speak on their behalf. Um, you know, I, I, I don't think it would be appropriate for me to kind of pronounce on that. Okay. okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. All right. So the questions are coming in fast and furious. We have a lot of questions for you guys. Uh, can or will this currency be used like a debit card? I think maybe you want to jump in on that one, Darren? Like, how is it different from using a debit card? Um, so there are companies working on um, offering services like that. Um, I don't think we're really at the point where that can really go live mainstream just yet. There are probably some technical hurdles, but it's, it's something that I've seen in the works. Okay. No. Jay, how about you? Can, you? can you offer some insight on that? So some people have asked me, how is it different than making an electronic transfer online as opposed to using cryptocurrency? What's, what's the difference? Jay, can you take that one? So how is using cryptocurrency to execute a transaction different from doing a, a funds transfer online or say using your debit card, which is also an electronic transaction? Are you talking about to participate in an offering, for example, on the Jamaica Stock Exchange? Using cryptocurrency to buy goods and services. How is that different from me using my debit card? Okay, great question. So basically what would happen is you would have to do a, a transfer from your, your cryptocurrency account. So let's say, for example, you opened up a, uh, a trading account at VM and you had some cryptocurrency inside of there. And then there was a vendor who accepted, let's say, Bitcoin uh, as a payment method. What you could do is you could process a withdrawal transaction. Uh, you, you would get a specific address from the vendor. They would give you an address specifically for you. And you would go to VM and you would put that inside of the user interface in, in the platform and you would request them to do a, a withdrawal. Okay. And what that's going to do is it's going to send those amount of coins over to the vendor in order to process your payment. So the process is a little bit different. Uh, there's also people that have wallets on their phones or manage their own wallets. But most people don't like to kind of uh, manage the private keys and they would rather uh, utilize the traditional financial institutions to manage these type of digital assets. Yeah, um, I, I think a major difference would be the, the time lag between the two. Um, whereas the with a debit or credit card transaction, um, the transaction itself can happen instantly. Um, with a transaction over, for example, Bitcoin, it would take a couple of minutes due to um, the on-chain settlement. However, the transaction would settle fully in 10 minutes, whereby um, on the back end with the credit card, it may settle at end of day or overnight or what have you. Um, there are layer two solutions being worked on for um, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies, which will, which are aimed at um, speeding up some of that um, transaction time, so that you can actually have, you know, for want of a better term, instantaneous transactions that um, settle back to the chain. Mm -hmm. Kadil, back to the regulatory environment. Are there existing regulations here in Jamaica that will or would support the use of cryptocurrency? Or are there legislations that or regulations that actually prohibit that or inhibit that? Um, well, embedded in the, the digital asset market rules that we have, uh, we do have the facility or it enables um, the trading of cryptocurrency, in particular Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, but uh, any broker, and it will have to be a broker who would be taking um, the, the cryptocurrency to market, um, they would have to, you know, give a, 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 a little um, detail on the, on the currency. They would have to provide a fact sheet and analysis, and they would submit uh, that to the JSC and the FSC for approval. Um, so all the rules that we have drafted or that we have, um, we're working on um, does include um, actually um, listing currencies on the market. So Marco and Jay, you guys are doing a lot of work with, uh, with agencies here in Jamaica and helping to develop this system that's going to be launched soon. Can you tell us, are there any plans to deploy blockchain-based point-of-sale solutions like Pondix here? And that's from Marco or Jay? Um, go ahead, Jay. 
Yeah, a great question. So, I mean, uh, uh, we, we do have a partner company uh, that has like a, a business solution uh, for accounting and business management as well as managing payments. So that is something that uh, we feel would be beneficial to, to companies in the future. Um, but that's that that would be a little bit down the line. Mm -hmm. There's always there's always ways to advance technology. Um, that's what I would say. Where block stations, very agile, moving. So we understand what's coming for us in the future in terms of, you know, what is required to you know uh, evolve these type of these type of technologies like blockchain and how how can we start you know like as you mentioned embedding these payment methods and the operations to vendors and so on and. Um, that's always coming forward. It's, we're very agile moving, but we see that coming in, in the next, I would say, like maybe perhaps like projected, you know, two years. This is my, this is my thought. Interesting. Well, we look out for that. So here's another very good question that we got online. And this is a very common question as well. What is the risk exposure to using cryptocurrency to both banks and to end users? I don't know who wants to take that one. Well, the, the risk exposure, I would say for, I mean, we've seen a lot of, uh, you know, a, a lot of headlines in the past with regards to different cryptocurrency exchanges being hacked. And Kadil had explained earlier in her presentation that what they have is a, a cold storage multi-sig vault, which makes it impossible to hack. And this is really important because you, you, they don't want to be exposed to that type of a hacking risk. Um, so this is this is one thing that, in terms of the financial institutions that are considering uh, holding on to these assets on behalf of their customers, this is something very important that they have to have the right protocols in place in order to manage the the private keys, so that there's there's no losses in that manner. And Darren, this question is for you. This is one specific to VM Wealth. So one Bitcoin today is worth almost nine million Jamaican dollars. It's a lot of money, right? But just one Bitcoin is like almost sixty thousand US dollars. So how will VM Wealth facilitate like minimum wage earners, for example, or low earners to invest in high value currency like this? Well, sure. Um so well, you say one is um, roughly nine million dollars. It's uh, it's about fifty, fifty seven or so thousand US dollars. Um, at the same time, when you look at the divisibility of Bitcoin, it's actually up to eight decimal places. So I mean, when you look at the the dollar, you know, the lowest you can go is a cent. With with Bitcoin, it's you know point zero 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 zero. You know, so um, it can really be divided quite um, broadly downwards. Um, so you don't have to think that, oh my gosh, I can't afford one You don't Bitcoin. have to buy one. You, you don't can have to buy, buy a much. fraction of you one. You can buy a very small fraction. Um, you know, fees might make, you know, certain smaller purchases um, prohibitive. Um, I think as the space develops and it becomes more widely accepted, what, you know, what can come about are certain pooled funds whereby, you know, uh, the fund can facilitate the purchase of the crypto directly and persons can invest in a unit form and it's you know small and divisible maybe down to one dollar jamaican whereby somebody who does not much invest can interact with the space that's how it could be done mm. yeah. are there any banks that you can use like today right now to purchase crypto in jamaica no 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 so that is why this is revolutionary what's coming yeah it's, it's still very new yeah in the few, next few months yeah. uh, okay here's another one for uh, the guys joining us from, uh, well, I assume they're abroad, Marco and, uh, and Jay. Is Paxful a safe site for the purchasing of Bitcoins? Paxful, yes. are you guys familiar with it? Yes. Um, I, I'm familiar with uh, Paxful. There are many crypto exchanges out there that are um, allowing investors to come in and you know, trade cryptocurrencies. If you're asking if the question is Paxful safe, I mean, it's, I would, the right answer if I want to give that it's one of the safer ones, right? Um, I wouldn't say it's completely, completely regulated in terms of securities, but it's, uh, it's one of the safer ones. That, is, that would be my, my, uh, my answer to that. Now, can I use VMBS to buy cryptocurrency via Coinbase? Via Coinbase? 
That's the question. Um, I mean, that would what you need to do is uh, facilitate a transfer of funds to Coinbase. So as long as you can get the funds to Coinbase, you can use Coinbase. Yeah. So right, can you so. get the funds if you have a VMBS account? Are you able to make that transfer to Coinbase? Sure. I mean, once a wire transfer can be facilitated. Sure. Yeah, it's because I know simple. I know that some banks have been blocking the transactions when you try to 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 take funds from your local account and uh, deposit it into a, a wallet, a Bitcoin or cryptocurrency wallet. They, um, they block it. I'm not going to say year or any because I don't know if we have that type of restriction, but yeah. I, I don't know if that being explicitly um, policy here. Yeah. OK. All right. Uh, Kadil, this one might be for you. Will the JSC only trade BTC, Bitcoin, and Ethereum? Okay. okay. All right. All right. So, so I had um, actually alluded to the answer to that question earlier um, when I said that any uh, cryptocurrency that uh, um, a broker sees that they would want to, to, to trade on the digital asset market, um, what they would have to do is uh, they would have to be the, the, the broker, the sponsor, the broker sponsor who actually um, brings it to the stock exchange by, you know, doing an, an, an analysis of the, of the currency, you know, the history, the fact sheets on the currency, and they would submit that for approval to the JSC and the FSC. So it's not to say only Ethereum, only Bitcoin. Um, it would have to be dependent on approval by the JC and the FS. And even Bitcoin and Ethereum, that would have to be approved for listing on the exchange as well. Question two, will there be a walkthrough for people who would love to do this but still don't understand? Great question. <laughs> not sure who should take that one. Well, I can, since I'm on the floor, I, I can tell you what the stock exchange has been doing. And we started some investor education, I believe, before COVID. Um, 2019, we started um, the investor education. And we will be continuing with the investor education. Um, Blockstation has been partnering with us even in that investor education um, series. Um, but in addition, the brokers um, who will be registered, they will also be a part of the, the whole campaign. And they will also have a responsibility to educate their investors as to um, what is being offered so that they can um, Earlier, Everton spoke to sophisticated investors, so we would want to ensure that you know the investors are sophisticated um, before they can act and, and understand the market before they actually participate in the market. And that's how we're doing this type of forum too, right, Darren? Yeah, that was a very good question. Um, education is extremely important for something like this. It's in, indeed why we're doing something like this, and we'll continue to do things like this as. Um, the space in, um, evolves, and she's as she rightfully said, um, as service providers, we do have part of our responsibility is to provide that education to our clients. So on a more one-on-one -on -one basis, that's something that we will seek to do as well. Okay, uh, I'm not. I don't remember who alluded to this. It might have been Cadill. Uh, somebody's asking, do you mind saying who this accredited dealer is in Jamaica? All right, so what I, I was um, referring to is the fact that any dealer who, who is going to be trading um, digital assets will have to be registered. Um, that is a process that um, um, there isn't a registered dealer as yet, but I know that there um, are dealers who are engaging in the process so that uh, at the time we are ready for um, the launch of the market, we will have a, a registered um dealers, member dealers. Crypto asset, could you confirm if I am the ultimate custodian asset, meaning it goes in my independent wallet? Jay, can you take that one? Yeah, definitely. So when you when you buy uh, any kind of digital assets on the JSC, you're doing so uh, you're doing so through your broker dealer. So if, for example, you would open up an account with VM Wealth and you would, uh, for example, deposit your cash there. And then you would have your cash available on the marketplace to buy any of the digital currencies. The broker and the depository uh, have, have basically custody of the digital assets, which are registered in 
the ultimate beneficiary's name, which is the investor. Uh, so the investor doesn't have to uh, deal in any of the private keys or anything like that. Uh, you can rest assured that the JCSD, Depository, and, and VM Wealth, uh, who are the key holders, have very uh, rigid, secure protocols in place which allows them to also make sure that your digital assets are 100% insured, right? So uh, we, we, can, we know exactly where the digital assets are. They are with the custodian. Another question to address to nobody in particular, but perhaps Darren, I guess, as with VM being the first that's going to be offering this type of service, will we plant any crypto ATM in Jamaica soon? ATM? Mm-hmm. Um, not to my knowledge. I mean, I guess it depends on how the space develops. They're available in other countries. So it's, it's a wait and see at this point. Okay. So another one for you, Darren. So how do I go about buying Bitcoin through VMBS? It's not available yet, right? But when it does become available, how do I do it? Um, so I guess there are some final points that, um, are still yet to be worked out, but, um, once you're signed up as a client and you have the requisite approvals, um, the platform will be accessible in a form that um, will probably be quite user friendly. So once that access is there and you know, you can always lean on your advisor to ask to guide, some, you. Yeah, to guide you to do some handholding because I mean, it's a new thing. So yeah, um, but yeah, it will, it will be pretty straightforward at that point. Boy, this question looks like this is for an economist, but let's see if anybody who's with us can take it. Uh, Kadil, I'll throw it out to you. I don't know if you can answer it. Here's the question. What is the projected impact of this digital currency to Jamaica's inflation rate? Um, well, I really would um, want uh, Darren maybe to assist me there since uh, you know, that's his, his line. Yeah, so um, that's a great question, but there's not really a one-to-one -a -one relationship. It really depends on the long-term flow of funds between here and um, overseas and, and how it works in that way. Um, I don't think there will be a direct impact from crypto itself mm -hmm. in that way. Um, I think there will be positives and negatives that have to be weighed. So for example, with this platform, companies will be able to raise money from a global standpoint. Um, that might be a net benefit to the currency um additionally persons will be able to purchase cryptocurrency some of these purchases will be to overseas entities on a net basis so you know there will be some in and out on, on that basis so um it's very difficult to say how on a net basis it will impact the country yes well it has definitely been a really exciting and very engaging conversation we hope to have a lot more like this because Obviously, based on the questions alone, there's so much more education that's needed in this space. We need to continue this conversation another time. Uh, so, Darren, just give us a summary now of VMWell's role in the space. Right. So, any last words of advice to us? Sure. Our role in the space at this point um, is from an educational perspective, uh, and we hope to continue to educate our clients. And once things get up and running with the JSC, 